Hey guys, Matt Bell here with Electric Violin Shop. One of the common questions we get from people is, I am plugged in and I still can't hear myself. It is a common problem and there are a number of possible solutions to this problem. I will warn you, I've got some soap boxes I'm gonna be climbing up on here and I'm gonna try my best not to be salty about these things. I can't promise anything, okay? I'm gonna try. I will say that the first thing is the unfortunate truth is that nobody on that stage can hear themselves as well as they want to. The sound pressure levels are simply higher than what human ears are designed to work in. So let's, let's temper our expectations and understand that you're not going to be able, no matter what, you're not going to be able to hear all the way around the edges of your sound the way you can in your practice room and still be able to hear your bandmates so that you can interact with them. So let's temper expectations. It's never on any rock stage, any in the history of history, it's never going to be what you really in your soul want it to be. So I, I'm not saying it can't be better, but um, let's, let's just make sure that we don't think that it's, we're going to be able to hear every single nuance of everything we play and hear everything that everybody else is playing too. Um, the next question is, where can you not be heard? Is it in the monitors or is it in the mains? And I've got thoughts, believe it or not, and we will talk about those. If it's in the monitors, you got to ask yourself, how are you hearing? Are you using an amp? You've got your amplifier with you that you brought and you plug into the amp, you turn it up so you can hear. Are you using wedges where you send your sound out to a board and they mix it and each person on stage has a different wedge monitor that they listen to. It's another situation. The third one is in-ears. Are you listening with in-ears? Those are kind of the three basic ways that people hear themselves on stage. So which one? If it's an amplifier, we want to make sure that we've got the thing pointed at our head, both vertically and horizontally. If you're standing off axis of an amplifier, if it's pointing this way and you're standing over there, you're not going to be able to hear it as well as you should be able to hear it which means somebody else is hearing it as well as you should be able to hear it, but you're not. That's a problem. The other thing is point it at your head. That's where your ears are. You don't have ears in the back of your legs. So I see this all the time. Guitar players got their amp pointed at the back of their legs and they keep going, I can't hear it. Turn it up. Can't hear it. Turn it up. Your knees are going deaf, but your head where your ears are cannot hear it. So angle it back, point it at your head. If it's too boomy and that's causing a problem, you can get it up off the floor. I don't know if you got to set it on a brick. If you need to hire a couple of roadies to stand on either side, that might not be the most cost-effective solution. Um, but yeah, raising an amp up off the floor makes a world of difference for how boomy it is. I can explain why if you really want, but time. Okay. You might need more amp. That's always a possibility. If you're using a little 60 watt amp, you've got a, a Fisherman Loudbox Mini, which is a fantastic amp. They sound great at your house. They sound great in a small coffee house type environment. You try dragging that thing on a punk rock stage where the drummer's hitting hard, you're never gonna hear that amp. You would be amazed how much power it takes to amplify a violin signal on a loud stage loud enough that you can actually hear it. 60 watts, you're not even close. So it's possible that you might need more amp. If you're using a wedge, let's think about what else is in your wedge. If we've got a lot of things fighting for sonic space, that's not good. It's just like it is in the physical realm. If I've got five cars trying to occupy one parking space, that's a problem. We're either gonna have to stack them up, we're gonna have to smash them and you understand. It's the same thing with sound. If I got five instruments trying to all occupy the same sonic space, everybody's sort of clustered around middle C for some reason, you're not going to be able to hear any of that stuff. It just, it, it crowds itself and it's a problem. Can you do it? You know, you go, well, you know, in a choral setting or an orchestral setting, we can't. Yes, because those sounds are coming from different places and your ears can separate those because they're coming from different places. If it's all coming out of one speaker, your ears cannot separate that because they're not coming from different places. They're all coming from the same place and they're all trying to occupy the same sonic space. That's bad. One of the solutions is to take everything out of your monitor. You go, yeah, but I have to be able to hear the keyboard player. You probably can hear the keyboard player even if he or she is not in your monitor. Try it. Keyboard players are notorious for playing too loud. So just because something's not in your wedge does not mean that you cannot hear it. 
It actually may help you to hear a keyboard player out of a keyboard monitor that's six feet away. Because again, it's coming from a different place and your brain really processes information extremely well when they're coming from different places, not as well when it's all coming from the same physical space. Um, so maybe try turning everything else down instead of turning yourself up. That's actually a really, really good solution in any monitoring situation, including in-ears. Um, if instead of turning yourself up, try turning other things down. That should always be the first move that you make. Ask yourself in your ears, hey, I can't hear myself. Is it possible that the guitar is too loud or the vocals are too loud or the drums are too loud? Turn those down first and see if that doesn't solve your problem. That's always going to be very helpful. I'm begging you, if you're wearing in-ears, wear both buds. You're saying, well, I can't hear myself. I've got one ear out. That's part of the problem. There's a thing called binaural summation, and it's the way that your brain processes auditory information. If it's getting the same information from both ears, it sounds louder. So if I pull one ear out, I'm going to have to turn my pack up in order to be able to hear as well as I did before. And not only have we removed the protection from this ear, that's half the reason for wearing in-ears, the sound protection, I've destroyed whatever... Um, benefit I was getting in my other ear and defeated the entire purpose. So if you're wearing in-ears, please, please, please wear both of your in-ears. It's really dangerous to just listen with one all the time. It's dangerous. All right. That covers monitoring situations. If we go to front of house, you're saying I can't be heard in a front of house. How do you know? No, seriously. How do you know? How do you know that you're not being heard in the front of house? Is, are you hearing this on tape? Like you heard a board tape from last week and you're like, maybe there's a little violin in there, but not a lot. Okay, that's one way to know. Another one, maybe somebody's shooting an iPhone video. Okay, maybe your friend is out there going, hey, I can't hear you. Those are different ways to know. All right, I won't say that they're definitive, but they uh, all of those have issues and we'll get to that. But the question is, how do you know? If you're saying I'm standing on stage and I can hear the speakers that are pointing away from me and I can't hear myself in those speakers that are pointing away from me, that's, that's, not, that's not a definitive answer saying, well, I know I'm not loud enough because I'm standing behind the speakers and I know what they sound like in front of it. No, you don't, because it sounds very, very different in front of the speakers than it does behind the speakers. If you have an engineer who you trust, ask them hey, I'm getting some feedback and people are saying that they can't hear the violin. Maybe your engineer's going to go, I mean, I can turn you up. Maybe they'll say that. It's always worth having that discussion first. Friendly. Don't hack off the engineer. That never ends well. Um, you can't necessarily trust a board tape. Board tapes only hear what's coming out of the board. And when you're in the room, you like if the guitar player has an amplifier, and there's sound coming out of that amplifier, then as an engineer, I only have to compensate for that. Like what I'm hearing out of the amp is almost loud enough, so I will put a little bit of guitar in the mains. But when you go back and listen to the board tape, the guitar players are gonna go, I'm totally buried in the board tape. I'm like, yeah, you were peeling my scalp back out front. So I, I only put a little bit of guitar in the mains because people on the other side of the room where your amp wasn't pointed at them, they still had to be able to hear you, but I couldn't put a lot of guitar in there because your amp was killing me. Sometimes if the drums, if the guy's just crashing and he's crushing the cymbals up there, I'm gonna shut the overheads off. And then you're gonna listen to the tape and be like, hey, there's no cymbals in the mix. You go, well, there were plenty of cymbals out front. So you can't always trust the board tape. iPhones, iPhones are interesting but they, they don't sound the same as the room does. I don't know if you've ever done this where you've shot video at a concert and went back and listened to it and you went, uh, that's not exactly what I remember it sounding like. That's because it's not what you remembered it sounding like. So take iPhone recordings with a grain of salt. Take your friends, especially your mom. I love you, mom, but I know I've never been loud enough for you out front. Take all that with, with a huge grain of salt. And then the last one yourself you cannot trust your ear out front. 
you want to hear yourself above everything else. How do I know? Listen to your monitor mix. Your monitor mix has you above everything else. You need it so that you can hear. But if you've been standing on stage and listen to yourself above everything else, if you walk out front and, oh my God, don't do that. That's so obnoxious. If you walk out front and listen, you're like, I can't hardly hear myself at all compared to what I'm used to on stage. Well, that's probably where you need to be. Remember, this is a whole ensemble. Unless you're Jean-Luc Pony and you're the, uh, you know, you're the name act, um, you're probably not going to be sitting on top of that mix like a cherry on a cake. You're, you're in the mix with everybody else. You're one of many. So, um, yeah, you, you can't necessarily trust the things that you're using to tell you that there's not enough of you out front. I'm not saying you can't because there are bad engineers out there. God knows there are bad engineers out there. But you make sure that you, when I say, how do you know that you can't hear, that you're not loud enough out front, be a little skeptical. If it is true that you cannot be heard out front, there are generally kind of three categories of reasons why you can't be heard out front. Equipment, tone, and technique. So let's dig into that. With equipment, if we have a weak signal, if I'm not sending a strong enough signal to the board, the engineer can deck my preamp, he can deck my fader, and I'm still not gonna have enough. So you wanna make sure that your signal chain, instrument, preamp, effects, amp or DI, I wanna make sure that all that signal chain is being managed properly so that I'm sending a strong enough signal out there that if the reason I'm not being heard is not because I'm not sending enough signal. So that's always the first thing. I want to make sure you're sending enough signal. You may not have a loud enough amp. And, and that's, if, if you need a bigger amp, you're going to need to get a bigger amp. Maybe more power, a different placement, and a different EQ. And I'm not digging deep into the EQ here. We have a couple other videos on that. And uh, I'm going to link them for you if I remember. Um, the next thing kind of tying into that is tone. Again, if we got too many things trying to occupy one sonic space, that's bad. Okay. Bad sound gets turned down. If you sound bad, if your tone is bad, if it's hurtful to the ears, if it's not pleasing, it's going to get turned down no matter how well you're playing or how many times your girlfriend goes and tells the sound engineer, oh my God, please turn him up. I can't hear him. He's going to go, if I turn him up, I'm going to get fired because it sounds terrible. It may not be the player's fault. Well, it's kind of the player's fault because it's your gear. But it may not be your playing. It may be that your gear sounds bad. Always a possibility. Just throwing that out there. When I talk about too many things in one sonic space, what I'm getting at is sometimes your, um, your choice of notes is not helping you. And not only just your choice of notes, but when you choose to play those notes. Let's think about the way this thing is put together. If it's a pop band or a country band or a rock band or worship band, whatever it is, what's the most important channel? No, it's not violin. I know. I really wish it was, but it's not. It's the vocals. So make sure that you're listening to the vocals and you're not trying to occupy the same sonic space as the vocalist. This is the number one thing I hear that's wrong when I go see bands, because I love to go see bands with fiddle players in them, because I'm hoping I might learn something. Too often, the thing I learn is, wow, you're not listening to the singer, because they're stomping all over the singer. They're playing in the same range as the singer. They're playing at the same time as the singer. They're trying to do something interesting while the singer is trying to do something interesting. And what happens is you're going to get turned down. So you want to make sure that you're not trying to occupy the same sonic space as the singer or the guitar player, or the keyboard player. You have to listen to what's happening on stage and then don't do that. If everybody's sort of centered on middle C, maybe you could go to the next C up. Or if you got a five string, you can go to the next C down. If everybody's sort of playing a one, a three, a five of the chord all at the same time, maybe you could think about a nine or a seven or a six. Just there are so many ways to, to be where other people aren't it's a good idea to be where other people aren't. And that's going to help you get hurt. Think about all of the things that are trying to occupy that sonic space, vocals, guitar, keys, and most importantly, not most important to me, it's the most important to me, but not to the world, violin. Okay. So just again, my soapbox here, 
don't occupy the same space or don't, you can't occupy the same space. Don't try to occupy the same space everybody else is trying to, because unfortunately you're kind of last in line. You're going to be the one who gets cut. Speaking of cutting, that's a very common thing we hear. I want to cut through the mix. He goes, sure you do. Of course you do. You want to cut through the mix. Well, there's three basic things we can do to help you cut through the mix. You cut the lows, you compress, and you boost the highs. Think about knives, though. That's what cuts, right? Knives cut. And we use knives to slice vegetables, to open boxes, do all these things. You know what else knives do? They cut your finger open. So you want to be careful about cutting. Because cutting is good if something needs to be cut. It can also hurt you. If you got too much cut, you're going to hurt people's ears and bad tone gets turned down. Remember? Bad sound gets turned down. That rhymes better. So the first thing, cut lows. Low frequencies, they suck power and they make mud. That's bad. So with a four string violin, uh, it's about 200 hertz. You can cut up to 200 hertz. You, you can dump almost all of that. You're not, there's no useful information down there. In fact, you can cut a little higher if you want. You can cut up into the mid twos without biting into your sound too much. And, and really think about how often there's only violin coming through the speakers and nothing else. Think about how often that happens in your ensemble. If you're like, man, I just lost all the richness in my sound when I cut up to 250. In your in-ears you did, out front, nobody's hearing that. That 200 to 250 hertz, which is where all that richness is coming from in your violin, all that's doing is getting in the way of other things. If you cut it out, it is not going to affect the mix out front, but it is going to clean up the mix. It's not going to have so much mud and your engineer is going to be able to turn you up and it's not going to be making things muddy and gross. The next thing you can do is you can compress without digging too deep into what compression is. It compresses your dynamic range. So if your softs are way down here and your louds are way up here, we compress that range. It knocks, the, it knocks the louds down, which has the effect of bringing the quiets up. And if you do that, instead of your engineer having to chase you all night, which he or she is not going to do, by the way, um, what's going to happen is whenever you're playing a solo, they're going to put your fader on there. And then when you're done playing the solo, they're going to pull it down a little bit, and then they're going to deal with other stuff. And if your solo is this loud and the rest of your stuff is this loud, well, then this stuff isn't going to get heard. So if you compress that range, the solo's here, everything else is here. Well, when they pull you down a little bit after your solo, this stuff is still loud enough to be heard. Does that make sense? Good. And then the next thing, and this is all in a row. So cut the lows first, then compress, then you can boost your highs. And this is the thing that is going to help you cut. This is where the actual cut is, but don't just boost the highs without doing the other two things first, because that's no good. Um, 2K is a good frequency to boost. Um, it's a good place to start. Three, um, got to be a little careful with 3K. It's one of those frequencies that's kind of problematic for violinists anyway. Um, but you can try it. Um, 5K is pretty high, but it may be that thing that sort of puts that sparkle in and helps you sort of sneak around the edges of some of those guitar players. 5K or 6K is kind of where the guitar starts rolling off. So if you put a little bit of five or six in your violin, it's going to sort of help you sneak around the end. You're going to do an end run on a guitar player, um, but it can be eh, it can be a little bit bitey. So be be careful with these things. There's 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 good and then there's like too good, which is bad. So does that makes sense. It didn't make any sense at all. Anyway, um, so all of that to say, there are some techniques. If you are not being heard in the monitors. I gave you some stuff there. If you're not being, if you don't think you're being heard in the mains, that may or may not be true. Um, but the, you know, sometimes it has to be approached delicately. Engineers can be very grumpy. Ask me how I know. Um, and then if you need to cut through, we just talked about a couple of things. Make sure that you're not stomping on other people's parts because that will get you buried. But uh, yeah. Anyway, I hope that was good. I hope it helped you. And uh, I try not to be too salty.